Hello and welcome back to Tuesday at Dobbs's. I'm ending up doing this a lot, I think. I'll start with an apology. I referenced the Moto Guzzi V7 last week as a... What did I reference it as? As a belt drive, it is shaft drive. So apologies, that shows the pathetic level of my mechanical knowledge. Welcome back. As always, please do carry on sharing all of your thoughts and opinions. Best place to do it is in the comments section below because I make sure before every episode I read through all of those for some inspiration and to see your general thoughts on specific topics. On top of that, if you've got a longer story, hi at Tuesday at Dobbs.com. You can email and you can also ping over a message on Instagram or I will share your pictures that you email me over on Instagram to Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs. So please do get in touch. It's hugely appreciated. I begin with some what I think is actually quite useful little consumer advice from Simon. Freddie, I have a 2008 Suzuki GSX 1400. It's a big beast of a bike, huge beast of a bike. I needed to replace fork seals recently. Whilst doing that job, I discovered a broken plastic part known as an oil stop. I went to my local go-to part supplier, which is Fowler's, and they were a back order item. Simon, I feel for you because back order items means they have no idea when they're going to come in. Same as my Triumph. I continue. I tried various other suppliers and it seems there were none in the UK or even Europe. But then an Australian guy on one of the forums I'm on suggested I go directly to a company in Japan called webike.net. Never come across them before. I did this and six days later the part arrived at my place of work. I was, Block Capitals, very pleasantly surprised at the efficiency and customer service. I received multiple emails from WeBike informing me of the various stages of my order. Too many companies blame the crap service on COVID or Brexit. This Japanese company shows just how good old-fashioned customer service should be done. Simon. Simon, that is incredible. Six days from Japan to the UK. Amazing. Let me go further on this, Simon, because I was curious about this. I opened up webike.net and I put the pictures up here and it was quite daunting and I've never done this before. Everything, of course, in Japanese with no obvious UK site. So I go onto a Japanese site. It's clearly a motorcycle parts supplier site, so I'm sure it's got the part I need, assuming I'm a Japanese bike owner. But how on earth do I navigate a page full of Japanese writing? I then Googled how to translate UK or how to translate any page into your chosen language. And up popped an immediate easy example. So just at the top bit, and you see a screenshot, just at the top bit of your search bar, you press on it and it says translate. So I got this Japanese page with all of these parts translated within about three seconds to full English. So I can use these Japanese sites, I can use foreign sites or foreign sites from anywhere in the world, get a tip off from someone like this Australian guy, save websites that you come across like webike.net, safe in the knowledge that all you have to do is click one button and that full on Japanese site is translated to English. And there it is all of the parts you're going to need. And with such incredible customer service, not that I'm surprised, Simon, being a Japanese company, they do things properly. Fantastic, really, really good consumer advice. Webike.net, I move on. To Yuri from the Netherlands. Freddie, after getting my license over a year ago, I got myself a 2005 Honda Hornet 600cc naked bike. Super happy with the purchase. It's ultra reliable, cheap, and very nimble in traffic, but still way too fast for my liking. I think these came in at about 90 horsepower or so, these Hornets. Good little bikes. Still a bit too fast for my liking, or way too fast, sorry. I mainly use it as a commuter bike for work in and out of the city. I got this bike to gain experience and confidence, but also not to, to break the bank. 
in case it got damaged or stolen. However, right now I'm also doing my best not to lose my license by having very disciplined throttle control. So I have a question. Just some context. I'm six foot two and my wife is five foot nine. Yes, we're Dutch before you ask, the land of giants. When taking my wife, I added the land of giants. It's not big headedness from Yuri. When taking my wife on the back of the Hornet, it feels really cramped and uncomfortable for her due to her height, 180 centimeters. And in general, I believe it's not a great bike for pallion, uh, for pallion, for passenger or pillion. I'm now looking for a bike that can suit my needs with regards to price, maneuverability. Okay, remember these key points for, for Uri. Price, maneuverability, and in-city riding, and can also accommodate my wife comfortably as a passenger on the back for coffee trips. We're open to trying out different bikes, and ideally I'm looking for something that's the motorcycle equivalent of the Fiat Panda. That's my kind of description. Cheap, practical, reliable, nimble, uh, and nimble, sorry, through busy traffic. Okay, cheap, practical, reliable, nimble through traffic. Fiat Panda equivalent. Budget, 5,000 euros or 4,200 pounds. Please do share your wisdom with us. Yuri. I think it's Yuri, U-R-I. Apologies if it's Uri. Great to hear from a Dutch rider. Yuri, what I've done here is cast my mind back for you. You're looking for a workhorse, so I have gathered all of my mental information from everyone kindly sharing their thoughts over all of the time since the very beginning of the podcast. What are the bikes that people always say are the most reliable workhorses? The simplest bikes to fix, the most reliable bikes, the bikes that are practical, make the most sense. We're not looking for an Italian stallion here. We're looking for something that's understated. So I'm thinking 600 cc or so. Comfortable, an easy bike to live with. A genuine mode of transport. And I've narrowed it down to three, and I do welcome, and I'd love to hear it actually, anyone who thinks they can top these three bikes for Yuri. Number one, it will come as no surprise at all to any of you. This is a bike that so many of you recommend. It is the Honda, the Honda, it's the Suzuki V-Strom 650. I almost gave away the second bike then, Suzuki V-Strom 650. What I'm going to do for all of these bikes is read the blurb from each of the websites for that new model bike, just to show what the, the dealers, the, the brands of bikes were, were aiming for, were marketing for when they released these bikes. So I'll begin with the V-Strom. This is in Suzuki's words, Suzuki V-Strom 650, the ultimate to do it all. Think of a challenge, an adventure, the answer to every thought. V-Strom 650. Road bends and stretches. Two up comfort, a tool that never lets you down. So what have I found? V-Strom 650 on Auto Trader, 2015 model Yuri, 4,200 pounds with 10,000 miles on the clock. And this Yuri is from a dealer. A lovely color in dark gray, it's again, not a looker specifically, but you just have to look at, from, look at it from a practical point of view. It's a perfectly decent looking bike. It's got a top box set up on the back. I can see there that two up comfort will be absolutely brilliant. And it's only, relatively speaking, eight years old. So relatively, this is a pretty new bike for the ones I usually recommend. All that reliability for just four thousand pounds. I think this is a very good shout as the first bike. The next one, Honda, and you'll all know this, NC750. I've gone for the X model. I've never heard of a bike that has more very, very nearly universally glowing reports from owners. Owners, Yuri, love these bikes. They say they are completely bulletproof or bulletproof reliability wise, and they are 
all the bike you will ever need and you can pick up a lovely 2013 model one for three thousand pounds let me put the pics up as i discuss this twenty thousand miles from a dealer three thousand pounds so easily found and that's just a 10 year old model so if you do look locally or from a private seller yuri you may well get it even cheaper than that here's what honda say about it i begin one motorcycle for everything Owners love the NC750X. They love its reliability and safety features. The high build quality, durable styling, do-it-all comfort and versatility makes this bike perfect for the weekend commute as well as weekend fun. And the final one, Yuri. I couldn't resist this one. I know I talk about it a lot, but you said you want a reliable workhorse and you want the Fiat Panda of motorbikes. Well, for me, nothing represents utilitarian two-wheel transport in the south of Europe, like the mighty Honda Transalp. Honda Transalp XL700, this is the one I found. 2,800 pounds for a 2011 model. No bike defines the term workhorse like the Transalp. This one's got 32,000 miles on the clock and is stated by the owner in this classified as, and I quote, the most reliable bike I have ever owned. This is what Honda say about the new Transalp, and it will translate down the bloodline back to this one. This bike is built to go the distance, so genuine comfort for two matters. An 850 mil seat height and 208 kilo curb weight make the Transalp easy to manage from walking pace upwards. The riding position is relaxed, yet sits you upright, offering great visibility and natural comfort. Yuri, you have to, you must let me know what you think of those three bikes and if you end up choosing one. And if anyone's got any better solutions, better ideas than those, I would love to hear from you. I move on. Moving on to, let's have a look at the next one, Bond's bike. I spoke last week about the BMW R1200C, the Bond bike from the 1997 film Tomorrow Never Dies. I thought it looked superb. Edgy, not traditionally beautiful, but very, very cool. And I think about 50% agreed with me and 50% of people think I'm completely mad in my love of this bike. I begin with, let me see how many I've got. I've got one, two, I've got three people, three people who have got back to me who have owned or own this bike. I'll begin from Canada, Stefan. Dear Freddie and Monica, greetings from Canada. I managed or I have ridden many motorbikes over the years. The most memorable ride, however, was my BMW R1200C, and it was a real head turner. The only problem I had with it was reliability since it was over 120,000 kilometers when I bought it, and the previous owner did not do a good job caring for it. Final straw, however, for this bike was when the drive shaft gave up and the repair cost, or and the repair cost me as much as the price of the bike. Once it was all fixed up, it had to go, but with many regrets, it really was the perfect machine. Stefan, I have to assume that in UK terms, that repair bill to fix the the shaft, the shaft drive, it must have been about four to five thousand pounds sterling to fix it. If you say it's about the price of a bike. Colossal, colossal, but still a decently glowing feedback from a previous owner. This one from Hugh. I have ridden, oh, this is a current owner. I've ridden an R1200C since 2014. It's been my daily commuter from Nottingham to Cheltenham through all sorts of weather all year round. Never missed a beat, easy to ride at any speed, rock solid, pulls out like a train with enough precision to take on the early M1 and M5 traffic, bulletproof, bought a workshop manual, tools and service it myself. It's nothing fancy, no troubling electronics, just nice and easy. It is a real head turner, so be prepared to have numerous chats and even photos. And it has, I've heard this, Hugh, 
It has a movable backrest, which is great for long distances. And Freddy, lockable panniers. The old girl is now in semi-retirement and still a pleasure to own. Hugh, thank you, Hugh. I've seen this and a few, a few people have mentioned this. So you've got the normal seat of the R1200C and the back pillion seat can either stay as a pillion or I believe it can flip upwards and act as a backrest for the rider. And then you can just, within a few seconds, just decide to click it back down and it becomes a pillion seat, which is brilliant. I'll do one final one here from Gary. Freddie BMW R1200C, my brother has one and purchased it from someone's garage, which was partly dismantled. The guy he purchased it from said it is the bike used in the James Bond film. The actual bike used in the Bond film. However, well, it's brilliant. My brother's never bothered to substantiate the claim. He loves the bike, but it does have an issue. Someone else mentioned this. Unfortunately, the quality, the quality of the chrome did not match the rest of the German manufacturing. So my brothers had to completely strip his wheels or strip his down to get wheels and bars, etc. Chemically shipped, uh, stripped, sorry, and rust proofed. Then it was re-chromed properly the way it should have been. Nowadays, it does look stunning, but it took him months and several thousand pounds to rebuild. Ugh. Okay, okay, you may need, I think it's fairly fair to say, you may need fairly deep pockets with these. Someone told me something recently interesting and it kind of applies to BMW motorbikes and you can translate that to a vehicle that I really like, the, the uh, Land Rover Defender. Someone said to me that and it's a bit like Triggs Broom, that old argument we have. What is reliability? Is reliability something like, for example, a Japanese bike where it costs peanuts to look after and they go on forever? Or is reliability something like a BMW GS that, yes, may do huge mileage, but here's the huge difference between a BMW motorbike and a Japanese motorbike. Both can do huge mileage, but BMWs are also equally as famous as the Japanese for doing huge mileages. But this is why Japanese bikes should get more respect. Because when a Japanese bike has a big failure, a big break, and let's say it may cost one and a half thousand pounds to repair this Japanese bike. Well, you will end up 99% of the time scrapping the Japanese bike because it's not worth fixing it because Japanese bikes lose their value fairly quickly. So you're not going to spend one and a half grand to fix a bike that's worth 800 quid. However, for BMWs, and this applies for the Land Rover Defender. For BMWs, if you go get a one and a half thousand pound repair bill, you're still going to repair that BMW because it's worth too much money. You're not going to scrap a motorbike worth four thousand pounds. And the same applies to the Land Rover Defender. The reason they're all still on the road, the reason they've got such huge mileage, some of them, 200,000 miles, for example, on the clock, isn't specifically because they're reliable. It's because their value never drops. So what are you going to do? Your Land Rover Defender breaks down, you have a 3,000 pound repair bill. Well, if you've got an old Nissan X-Trail 4x4, that gets scrapped. It's gone to the scrapyard in the sky. But if you have a three grand repair bill on a Defender, then you're going to have to repair it because who in their right mind would ever scrap a 15,000 pound vehicle, even if it's used? And the same applies here to the BMW R1200C. There's one bill of, I have to assume, about 4,000 pounds for the shaft drive. And there's another bill here of many thousands of pounds for repairing the chrome. Now, if this was a Japanese bike of a similar era, it either gets scrapped or you just have to accept the chrome is just falling off at will. But because it's a Japanese bike or because it's a German bike, because it's worth more money, you have to repair it because it's just worth too much to not repair it. Is that a rant? I don't know. I'll move on. Thank you all for sharing that. This is from Abilash. Abilash states, or Abilash says, hi Freddie. 
Oh, this is nice. I'm going to put these pics up as I talk about this because this is from an off-roading experience in Wales. Not something I've ever really considered before, but some of these pics from Abolesh makes me seriously reconsider that and also makes me consider buying a really light off-roading bike because this looks incredible fun. Freddy, after first learning about the Mick Extents experience in a 44 Teeth YouTube video way back in 2015 when I was in my first year at uni, I finally took the plunge and went for it just two days ago. It was quite possibly the most fun I've had in a very long time. I opted for the ultimate off-road day, which set me back 250 quid. But considering what you get, I believe it's pretty good value. The bikes provided were Beta Motorcycles RR2T300s, and they also supplied full RST riding gear along with AGV helmets. As the day progressed, the difficulty level of each exercise increased, and I distinctly remember starting off by a steep cliff and thinking, that looks insanely tough, probably meant for the pros only. However, by the end of the day, I found myself easily conquering that very cliff. Accompanied by seven others, we had the instructors Pete and Mick Extens's daughter, Sophie, guiding us. This took place on a 1500 acre forest in the north of Wales, bordering Snowdon Snowdonia. I recall riding alongside insanely tall pine trees beyond the edge of the road we were riding on, unable to see where they sit. The weather, ideal. A mix of overcast skies and light rain. Perfect enduro weather, I reckon. I did have a few falls, around four or five, without serious injury. But in my opinion, when it comes to dirt biking, if you're not falling, you're probably not doing it right. Only then will you know where the limits of grip are. I can easily say that this was the most exhilarating two-wheel experience I've had in a while. Regards, Abolash. Genuinely, Abolash, you make me want to do that. Looks fantastic. So that is Mick Extant's experience up in Wales to anyone interested. Thank you for that. Moving on to Dusseldorf, Germany. Freddy. Ah, this is useful. Freddy, here's a practical tip for doing some motorcycle maintenance. I bought this little scissor jack, pictures here, for 71 euros 25 cents, including postage and packaging, to ease the strain on my back while working on my 1972 BSA A65L 650 Export Lightning. Supposedly good for up to 350 kilos and needs very little space to store. It's a game changer. No more groveling around the floor, which is why it's now possible to work in comfort. As a tip, I've included a block of wood in between to prevent scratches on the bottom of the frame. Hope this helps you and all motorcyclists and ride safely. Greetings, Sher from Dusseldorf. I've got one of the... No, I don't. That's a lie. I've got something similar, Sher, but nothing that folds up this tightly and actually nothing that lifts up right in the middle of the bike. I'm quite tempted to buy one of these. If you have the exact brand name, let me know, because that is a really useful bit of kit, especially for people who live in apartments. And the BSA, stunning, absolutely beautiful, really beautiful. Moving on to the Honda CX500. I'll put the case here forward for this being the most practical, common sense, classic motorcycle over 40 years old that money can buy. Because last week I said that this was an ultra low emission zone busting bike and you also pay no tax and don't have to pay for MOTs. Well, a huge amount of you came back to me and said that this really is a superb bike and such a reliable bike, despite its age, that it really can be used on a daily basis. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I discussed a BMW and a Honda CX500 last week as a usable classic. This is the key point here, usable classic. But 99.9% .9 of people that came back to me didn't mention the BMW. 
They mentioned this Honda CX500, and there's a very good reason for it. This, from all accounts, was never an exciting bike. It was a workhorse of a bike. And what I didn't know, the Honda CX500 was the courier's bike of choice back in the 70s and I believe 80s as well. Let me just give you a bit of insight here. This is from Byron. The CX500 was the weapon of choice for couriers in London for over a decade. There's no reason why it wouldn't do the job now. Mark continues, yes, AKA the slug. This was the nickname. Many did 100,000 miles and beyond, basically unbreakable bikes. And from Sher, Freddie, I owned and rode a CX500 for dispatch work back in the 1980s. Very comfortable and accessible all around for maintenance, which it doesn't need much of. And from Stuart, Freddie, I had three CX500s when I was. Guess what Stuart did? Dispatch rider in the 1980s. All of them covered All of them covered in excess of 150,000 miles. It's incredible. In that industry, we all knew what would fail on them. Cam chain tensioners, drive rings and generators. So we prepared, uh, so we were prepared, sorry, and able to fix them. Superb machines. To have three motorbikes that all did over 150,000 miles, that is, almost Stuart unheard of. That's the best advert I've ever heard for any specific bike. And of course it's a Honda. And finally from Mark, just for a bit of balance in there. E10, the new fuel, is going to kill off these old bikes and cars. Yeah, Mark, there may be some truth in that. Thank you all for sharing that. But Honda CX500, usable classic. They will be going up in value. So if you're interested, I'd grab one fairly quickly. And I'll move on to a little bit of similar consumer advice here for the ultra low emission zone. This is for anyone who uses London as their place of work and has to ride in. This is from Mr. Tippus. Freddie, I live just outside the original ULES zone and have a 2006 Ducati Monster S4RS, which I'm not eager to part with. When ULES hit, I was advised to get a missions certificate from Ducati and submit it to the ULES people for exemption. I sent off to Ducati and it took them only a week to email me the certificate for my bike specifically and then another week for ULES to go through it and issue an exemption for my bike. So even though my motorcycle is older than 2008, I don't pay the ULES charge. And that's for a big, hungry 1,000cc bike. I'm sure most bikes from the thousands, the 2000s, will pass the emissions test for you, Les. Let me do one more here from Cat B. This surprised me because this is, this is a carved bike. Freddie, my 2005 Triumph T100 was down to pay you, Les. So you go onto the London website, click on it, it says, yep, Triumph T100, you need to pay you, Les. But listen to this, but I checked my V5 logbook and conformity certificate and my NOx, my nitrous oxide level was lower than the TFL, the Transport for London, ULES level. So I emailed TFL with a copy and TFL confirmed that my nitrous oxide level was within their standard and confirmed that I now did not have to pay you less. So worth checking your V5 or conformity certificate. That's seriously good advice. Moving on, bike of the week. Quite different this one. Dear Freddie, I went to the Harley dealership and test rode an Electroglide. Disappointing. For 16 and a half thousand pounds, you would expect it to be super, but instead it wouldn't ride straight. The suspension was wallowing, etc. I have used your car vertical link to confirm my last check before buying this beauty from the Isle of Skye via eBay. It's a £6,000 2011 BMW K1600 that was the big, oh, that has just had, sorry, the big £1,400 service completed in the past few months. That's painful. 
I am waiting or I'm wanting to tour with my wife and see the Wild Atlantic Way in Ireland and explore the Pyrenees and Andorran Mountains. Roddy from Southampton. Roddy, that is a huge amount of bike for the money for £6,000 and the fact it's had its big service done. These are tantalisingly good value for such a colossal, capable machine. Here's why these are good. And this is exactly the kind of used bike that's exciting. They are gigantically expensive when new, these bikes. But now, let's say 10, 11, 12 years on, you can save colossal amounts of money. Another good thing about bikes like the K1600. Let me see if I can get a classified up here. I found a classified of one similar to Roddy's. It's £6,250. It will be tech laden. It will have everything you could ever dream of. But these are the exact kind of bikes from owners who will not scrimp and save on any of the servicing. These bikes will have been cosseted, looked after to the letter from the service book. This one I found is 10 years old and it's the K1600 GTL. These bikes, when new, I think, to the best of my knowledge from my research, around about 10 years ago or so, I believe they were between 17 and 22,000 pounds for the top spec, around about that ballpark figure. Even then, 11 years ago or so, they were colossal money. So now the equivalent model would be astronomical. This one here is fully kitted out. It's got the panniers on either side, of course they're lockable, and it's got the top box with a proper pillion seat. So if you're looking for a massive touring machine, 6,000 pounds seems like incredibly good value. And have a listen to this from the owner. It's exactly what you want in a description. Full length description, takes up a whole page. 2013 BMW K1600 GTL, sold with full MOT and service with just two previous owners on the V5 consisting of two private owners and supplying main dealer. Full service history comprising of five BMW dealer stamps and five independent stamps, including a service prior to sale, usual refinements, Cruise control, built-in sat-nav, electronically adjustable screen, onboard stereo system, heated grips, top box with pillion backrest built in, remote central locking for luggage and alarm system. I didn't know that was possible even now. Extras on this bike include engine bars with spotlights, paint protection, wonderlich side stand and larger i could go on and on they've got the fob security keys all instruction books yada 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 super smooth six cylinder bike it's quite tempting just to see what the ultimate two-wheeled machines like and when prices get that good it's tempting it is to see how a machine like that is to live with i'll end it there Thank you so much everyone for watching this week's episode. Please do carry on to get in touch and sharing your thoughts and thank you all for getting involved. Have a fantastic week. I'll speak to you in the next one.